Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to Hinduja Global Solutions Limited Q2 and H1 FI22 Earnings Conference Call. As a reminder, all Part 7 lines will be in the listen-only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchtone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Snyder Albuquerque from Matt Factors. Thank you and over to you, sir. Thank you, Neeraf. Good evening, everyone, and a warm welcome to the Q2 and FI, H1 FI22 results conference call of Hinduja Global Solutions Limited. We are joined by Mr. Partha Devarkar, Executive Director and Global CEO, and Mr. Srinivas Palakodeti, Global CFO, to discuss the Q2 and H1 results and the key developments during the period. Before we begin the conference call, I would like to mention that some of the statements made during the course of today's call may be forward-looking in nature, including those related to the future financials and operating performances benefits and synergies of the company's strategies, future opportunities and growth of the market of the company's services and solutions. Further, I would like to mention that some of the statements made in today's conference, conference call may be forward-looking in nature and may involve risks and uncertainties. I would further like to mention that if there is a call drop during the course of the conference call, please bear with the management because of COVID-19, all of us are taking calls on mobiles from different locations. Hence, call drops may be recurring a recurring problem. Thank you, and over to you, Partha, sir. Uh, thank you, and uh, good evening, good morning to everybody who's taken the time to join us. I really appreciate all of you coming here and listening to us. And. Uh, our earnings presentation has been uploaded on both the stock exchanges and it's also there on the website. So while I'm speaking, I'm going to refer to the slides that are there on the earnings deck and for the ease of understanding, I would encourage all of you who are on the call to also refer to the same deck as we speak. With that, I would like to give you uh, highlights of our quarter. It has been an extraordinarily strong quarter as you all have seen based on the numbers that have been published. Our revenues uh, for quarter two are 15,826 uh, rupees. And uh, that in, uh, and that is about an 18.8% growth in our revenues if you compare it with the previous quarter, or previous years, uh, the same quarter. EBITDA, is grown up by 2,269 crores, uh, sorry, uh, 2,269 million, and that is a 21.2% growth over the same quarter of last year. Profit before tax, 1,705 million, 88.6% growth over the same quarter last year. And profit after tax, 1,365 million, a 67.9% growth over the similar quarter last year. So you obviously see that these numbers are rather spectacular numbers, and there's a good growth everywhere in revenue, profitability, and especially in profit after tax, uh, being able to declare 67.9% growth in profitability is obviously something that we are very pleased about. So those are the headline numbers for the quarter, and I will now compare the first half of this year with the first half of last year. Here, some of the numbers are even better, and that has to be put in the context of the fact that the first half of last year was impacted significantly by COVID. And this year, COVID has become business as usual for us. We've learned to thrive in COVID, We've learned to do business in COVID. We've learned to work from home and still do business. So our revenues are 31,331 uh, million, which is a 22% growth for the half year of last year. And our 
EBITDA is 4,590 million, a 37.9 percent growth. Again, very impressive growth numbers. But the spectacular growth numbers really come in the profit before tax and the profit after tax. The profit before tax number is 3,347 million, a 101.7 percent growth over the similar, uh, similar half year last year. And the profit after tax as well is 2,535 million, that is 94.2 percent growth over last year. So these numbers clearly look impressive, and I said the context of this comparison clearly has to be understood that we had COVID impact strongly in quarter one of last year, and therefore, when you compare even the half year numbers, the numbers are going to be uh, much, much better this year. If you move to the next slide, I will talk about uh, our growth momentum. We've seen really good growth momentum in our healthcare and the public sector business, uh, leading to significant growth and ramp-ups. Uh, our public sector business uh, in the UK has had a spectacular performance, a revenue growth of 102% year on year. And I'm also pleased to tell you that a large part of this growth uh, you know, we've always had a good growth coming from healthcare business. But this is the first quarter that we are seeing that the rest of the business, the non-healthcare business, has actually grown faster than the healthcare business. So if you look at the healthcare business, it is uh, grown by 13.5% for, uh, for the first half of the year. And if you look at the non-healthcare part of the business, it's grown by 35.3% uh, uh, for the first half of this year compared to the last year. So this is, in fact, unique in this year that our growth momentum has come from the CES business as compared to what traditionally has always been driven by the healthcare business. In rupee terms, also, the numbers are reasonably similar. Uh, you would say that uh, the growth in the rest of the business is grown with specific numbers I'm going to tell you. It's grown from 11,844 million last half of the year, or the, or the first half of the last year, to 15,812 million in the first half of this year. That is a 33.5% growth on the CBS business. Compared to that, the healthcare business last year was, uh, last half of the year was 13,852 million. That has grown to 15,590 million. That growth constitutes 12 point, uh, about 12%. So you would see that the CBS business has actually grown more than double of that of the healthcare business, giving us an overall growth number of 21.9% in rupee terms and 23.5% in uh, uh, dollar terms. Our digital business has also done well. We've signed up 14 engagements with new and existing clients. Uh, client wins are impressive as well. 10 new logos across verticals for core BPM services and seven for HR on payroll processing in quarter two. We continue to significantly work from home and uh, we haven't really gone back to offices. And as of now, I can only tell you that there are no plans, to, uh, no concrete plans to bring people back to work because there is no requirement to do that. Even though vaccination rates have improved, and uh, yeah, I think in most countries, the numbers are more under control, we still are being very, very cautious and taking each day at a time and not really uh, looking at coming back to work and increasing risk for our workforce. Given the fact that it actually has not resulted in any different product, uh, productivity, there is, we see no reason why we should be concerned with that. Added factor is that, that while we use work from home as a principal mode for delivery, our operating expenses go down, and that's another strong reason why we believe that work from home is going to be a big chunk of our delivery going forward. Our headcount as on September 30th, 2021 is 46,698, an increase of 3,929 from the last quarter. 
And if you do the rest of the outlook, I would say that uh, with global travel is moving. And uh, in fact, both me and Paula are in North America. Uh, we came here as soon as North America opened up for travel. And with global travel improving and the sentiments uh, for business also improving globally, that only bodes well for our industry. And we see demand coming back from some of the sectors which are under pressure like travel and hospitality. We don't have much exposure to that. We have a few clients who are in that. So those clients will uh, obviously um, prosper from the improvement in global travel. So <laughs> going forward, the healthy, uh, the same pipeline is very as well, uh, healthy as well. Uh, I shared with you the respective growth numbers of CES and the healthcare business. Uh, I am encouraged to see that the CES business has continued to grow from strength to strength, and the growth moment then is going to continue in the second half of the year as well. While we speak to be able to handle this additional growth, we are actually setting up two new centers in Jamaica and Northern Ireland. This, you may believe, is actually um, contrary to what I've said, that uh, you know most of our growth, most of our production will be on a work from home basis. So why are we building up centers then? Uh, the reason we are doing that is that our delivery footprint, work from home, far exceeds a situation where if you were to all come back to work, then the Seeds that we have will not be sufficient. So we have to build the right balance between how much is work from home and how much seats do you have as capacity if you need to come back to work. So you can't be in a situation where you don't invest in brick and mortar at all. And then as and when people declare that they can they can come back to work and people want to start going back to work, you don't have seats to be able to uh, bring people back to work. So. We don't want to be in that situation. That is the whole rationale behind why we are still investing in a few centers while we are divesting in some other centers, which we believe we don't need for the future. So it's a balancing act that we're doing. Cash generation is very good. Paula is going to cover that in his section. We continue to reduce debt. And we have also increased the dividend this quarter, and that will be our continued focus to explore or continue to reward our shareholders. Before I hand over to Pala, I'm going to give you um, uh, statements on the divestment of the healthcare services business. The divestment is on track. Uh, by and large, uh, most of the regulatory approvals uh, that we that are required in the four geographies that this deal is actually getting done are in the process of getting approved. We don't see any concerns out there. Um, uh, you will recall the transaction was based on an enterprise value of 1.2 billion, uh, and it's subject to closing adjustment, shareholder, and other regulatory approval. The divestment has been approved by the shareholders in the region uh, held on 23rd of September 2021. And as I said, we are on track to get most of the approvals, and we see no concerns as to get to the final closure. With that, I'm going to hand this over to Pala for the details of the financials. So, Pala, over to you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Parker. Uh, before we start, I just want to check, is, is my audio clear? Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. So, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome once again, and thank you for joining us on this call. I shall cover the financial section, and I shall move to slide nine. Uh, as Parsa mentioned, it's been a quarter of very strong growth. Uh, our revenues have grown by about 18.8% uh, over the same period last year. And within this, uh, both sectors have contributed to the growth. The healthcare business has grown 11.3% on year-on-year basis, while the non-healthcare business, coming primarily from UK, has grown at a phenomenal 28%, delivering overall growth on year-on-year basis of 18.8%. The EBITDA growth is 21.2%. We've had some 
um, benefits of exchange rates. So you would see an increase in the other income between quarter ending September 21 and quarter ending September 20. Relating, resulting PVT growth of about 88.6%. Uh, uh, coming to the PAT part, the growth on a year-on-year uh, -year basis has been 68%, and about 16.6% is on the on a sequential basis. Uh, just to recap, the tax uh, provision for the quarter ending September 20, uh, which is Q2 of last financial, is lower because we had some reversal on the, we created some deferred tax assets because of some internal restructuring. And hence, the tax line tax provision for Q1 of, uh, Q2 of FY21 uh, was low. Uh, now it is at a more normative level, and the PAT growth uh, after factoring the other components has grown by about 68% on a year-on-year -year basis. And on a sequential basis, the growth rate has been 16.6% for, uh, for Q2 of FY22, and keeping in line with the performance of the company, the interim dividend, which was which stood at six rupees, I'm sorry, seven rupees for the quarter ending June 21, has been increased to 10 rupees per share as second interim dividend for the quarter ending September 21. Moving to the next slide, again, uh, a performance which is very strong, growth in revenue terms in rupee terms has been 22%. Again, the growth on the CES side, the non-healthcare has been faster than the growth on the healthcare side. Significant increase in EBITDA. Uh, it's grown by about 38%. And the margins have also increased by about 100, 160 basis points to 14.6%. At the PBT level, um, profits are up by about 102%. And at the PAT level, uh, profits are up by about 94%. So overall, a very strong performance in the second half of the year, uh, sorry, in the first half of FY22 compared to the same period of FY21. As Partha mentioned, first half of FY21, we did have some costs relating to COVID uh, uh, rolling out work from home. But as we mentioned, uh, work from home has now become the norm and these reflect the performance of our uh, <clears throat> company for the first half of the year. Moving on to, uh, uh, from an origination perspective, the revenue by vertical, healthcare is about 51%. Uh, we have done some tweaks because there are some parts of the business which were originally in the healthcare sector, uh, but which would continue to be with a GS, these pertain to healthcare clients of our digital business or the HRO business. So there has been some uh, reclass there. So healthcare now accounts for about 51%, uh, sorry, a little over 51%, and the rest of the business accounts for about 49% uh, of the total revenue. From an origination perspective, Revenues from U.S. continue to be the largest at about 69.2%. Uh, the call-out item is really the U.K. business, uh, which is 15.5. And as this was roughly in the 7-8%, um, you know, about a year ago. And as Partha mentioned earlier, this has grown by more than 100% uh, U.K. originated business. So the share of U.K. also is showing up at a high 15.5%. And you can see now it's even higher than what our revenues from uh, Canada. Uh, <clears throat> next, moving on to the next slide. Uh, we have debt of about 3,445 million, which is about 47%. Uh, there has been a reduction between 31st, uh, 31st March, 30th June, as well as um, coming up to 30th September. So the reduction in the first half of the year is 491 million or 
49 crores. Within the existing debt, about 47% are term loans. Uh, and the balance are coming in the form of working uh, capital. And as Partha mentioned, our endeavor would be to continue to uh, reduce debt. Uh, moving on to the next slide, slide 30. Uh, this talks about the uh, increase in levels of cash as well as in terms of reduction of debt. Both have shown movements reduction in debt and increase in cash, leaving SGS as of 30th September as a net cash company of 500.8 crores or 5,008 million rupees. Uh, our cash flow uh, continue to be strong. Uh, we had DSO days of 72 as of 31st of March 21. That dropped to 68 days as of June, and that has dropped further to 66 days as of March, so as of September 21. Uh, in terms of capex, there has been some increase uh, between Q1 and Q2, uh, primarily because of what we mentioned. We are adding capacity uh, in Jamaica and to some extent uh, in UK commensurate with the growth and to make sure that uh, you know if we need to come back to work we have enough capacity so as Partha mentioned that's there's no fixed line timelines for this from a key um, from a free cash flow EBITDA to free cash flow conversion that continues to be uh, strong though it has been a slight I mean there's been a dip between Q1 and Q2 uh, that's primarily driven by higher capex rather than cash flow from the operations or working capital chains. The business ROC, which excludes the treasury income, with growth in performance that has continued to rise and for the quarter on an annualized basis stands at 25.8% as compared to 24.9% annualized on Q1 of FY22. Uh, we continue to take forward covers uh, on a rolling 12 months, 24 months, 36 months table. You will see there are three buckets. Obviously, the largest uh, coverage is for FY22, uh, and it comes down for 23 and 24. We have good rates uh, compared to the spot rate, upwards of 80 for FY23 and upwards of 83 for uh, FY24 and 25. Uh, similar position in Philippines, we have forward covers of about 100, and 100 million for FY22 and about 27 million for FY23 uh, with a rate of about 50.6. Uh, so summing up uh, from a balance sheet perspective, we continue to be having a very strong balance sheet. Uh, net worth of 22,600 billion, book value of about 1,082 rupees per share. In the first half of the year, we have given 17 rupees per share as dividend, 7 rupees for the quarter one, and 10 rupees for quarter two. And currently, the stock price is trading somewhere in the P by E ratio of about 12.6. Uh, traditionally, we have given you revenue profile for the SGS as a whole. Uh, in the subsequent slides, what we are done uh, going to do is cover the revenue profile of the business, uh, showing the healthcare business separately, and the rest of the business, uh, which is the non-healthcare or CES business. Uh, this is obviously being done, keeping in view the uh, impending sale of the healthcare business. Um, from a, if you look at slide 18, on the healthcare side, the client concentration, the largest client accounts for the for about 39 percent of total revenues, uh, and the top five uh, goes up to 83.5 percent. For the rest of the business, non-healthcare or CES. 
the share client concentration shares dropped significantly. Uh, the healthcare, the top clients dropping down to 12, and the top 10 customers dropping down from about 92 to 59. On an overall basis, on an aggregate basis, the client is up, the top client is about 19.3, and the top uh, 10 customers would account for 67.1 percent. From a channel mix perspective, uh, the healthcare business is fairly split equally. Um, about 51 percent is non-voice, and 50 uh, 49 point four percent comprises voice and digital. Whereas on the non-healthcare, the CES business, uh, the share of digital uh, goes up uh, to about 9.5%. The non-voice portion is smaller at about 10.6%. And about 80% is the overall <clears throat> is the voice business. On an overall basis, uh, voice is about 71%. Non-voice is about 22, and we have about 6.7 percent uh, coming from the digital business. Uh, if you go by revenue profile from a country of origination, uh, healthcare is pretty much everything is from US, so it shows uh, it's a single origination geography uh, at 100 percent coming in from US. On the non-healthcare side. Uh, it's fairly diversified. Um, U.S. continues to be the largest, but down to about 38%. Uh, Europe, U.K., that's the second largest, which is about 31%. And then Canada is the third largest at about 19%. Uh, India, which is primarily a HRO business, as well as we, we do some digital revenues originating from India, coming in at about 10%. But on an overall basis, uh, U.S. continues to be the largest at about 69%, uh, with U.K. at 15.5 and Canada at about 9.4%. Uh, moving on to the next slide, this shows the stock price movement for the last 12 months. And if you look at slide 21, HGS share price has gone up about 278% as compared to CNX IT of about 65% and Nifty 50 of about 40%. Uh, uh, that's all I had in my section. Uh, we would like to open up for the Q&A. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, once again for joining us on this call. We look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone? Who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembly. Participants, you may press star and one to ask a question. The first question is from the line of Nagraj Chandrasekhar from Laburnum Capital. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you. Uh, so could you please update us on the timeline expected for the transaction to consummate given you said everything is in place and when it was originally announced a 90 to 120 day period, which implies a, a sort of November uh, 10th to a December 10th date uh, timeline is sort of implied. So, Mr. Rodgers, that kind of uh, is still on track, I would say. Uh, most of the regulatory involved, the regulatory uh, approvals that we require to close this transaction across the four geographies, we're expecting um, to be met within the dates that you mentioned. After that, it's the logistics of uh, uh, getting the operational work done. So, all of that is in track. Understood, understood. And just uh, Thank you for breaking out the business mix on a pro forma basis between the continuing and the divested businesses. Could you also give us some more color on the the operating metrics on margin and working capital uh, for the non-healthcare business and how much operating cash you need to run, the, run this business given 
I think at around the 3,000 crore run rate, we're already at 500 crores of net cash on the balance sheet. Yeah, that's a very good question. So I'm going to uh, deflect this question to Pala. We may not have those numbers ready for this presentation, but uh, if you can provide that subsequently, you can do that. But Pala, probably you can give those numbers on a uh, on a high level on this uh, on this call. Sure, thank you. Uh, uh, good set of questions. Uh, let me answer them to whatever extent I can. Let's uh, <coughs> to the non-healthcare uh, or the CES business as we call it. That's about, as you have seen from the uh, presentation, about 50 close to 50% of the total uh, revenue. Uh, a l large chunk of this, uh, as you would have seen from my uh, earlier portion, uh, the Revenues are coming in from UK, which is again predominantly public sector. And yeah, unlike you know maybe in other geographies or what may be the perception, in UK the uh, you know the we get paid as per contracted term. So at the overall level, uh, I don't see any significant difference between the DSO days for the healthcare business as well as for the uh, CES or the non-healthcare business. Uh, potentially, it is going to, it may even be better than what we have for the healthcare business. Uh, the other aspect is in terms, so that would take address the issues of uh, DSO days. Again, from a CapEx point of view, it is more driven by uh, the location rather than by the nature of business. Uh, whether it's healthcare or CES. Right? So if I have to set up a seat in US uh, or in Jamaica, uh, it is agnostic whether the nature of business is going to be from healthcare or from CES. Uh, I hope that addresses uh, your questions, Mr. Nanda. Uh, and on margin? Margins, we, you know, as we said in our AGM, uh, we are looking, expecting margins to be around in the low digit, uh, low double digits uh, from every time margin to say. Understood. Got it. I just one, thank you. Just one last question. You've seen a very large spike in hiring this quarter. So just curious, is this to replace anticipated attrition that are sort of serving out notice periods? Or is this because you foresee a lot of growth on the non-healthcare side? And uh, just, just wanted some more color on why we've seen such a strong bump up in numbers. So we generally prepare for quarter three and quarter four. So because of the seasonality in the healthcare business, the um, the hiring ramps up in quarter two to uh, meet the demand of quarter three and quarter four. Also, you have seen that the UK business has actually grown significantly. So a lot of hiring is happening in UK as well. Got it. Thank you. Thank you very so much. Participants, you may press star and one to ask the question. The next question is from the line of Siddharth Oberoi from Prudent Equity. Please go ahead. Yeah, good evening. Yeah. So you know, I want to know, you know, is there is there any warranty or claims or any penalty clause in this uh, healthcare division sale uh, where you don't meet the timeline so you know, there's some amount can be cut or something? No. There's nothing like that. So the buyer cannot walk out of the deal right now, is that? I think there's concerns. Yeah. Of, uh, there are no concerns like that. As I told you in the previous question, we are on track for getting regulatory approvals. Regulatory approvals are required in India, Philippines, Jamaica, and US. And we are mostly uh, expected in the next uh, two, three weeks. Okay, and uh, any geography, or, uh, you mean all the four geographies are right now open, nothing has been concluded in any of them? No, I wouldn't say that. Some approvals have come in, in their respective geography, uh, whereas some approvals are required. It's not just one approval, there are multiple approvals required. From, uh, so the approval required from competition commission, there is approval required from export processing zones, all of that. And some approvals need to come to HGS and some approvals need to come from Bearings. 
So yeah, so a large chunk of the approvals have already come in. Some are still uh, on track to close in the next two to three weeks. Okay, so last uh, in the last phone call, we had said that there is no one single check, and there'll be multiple, uh, you know, payments that will come from each geography. That so, is correct. That is correct. Okay. All right. Okay. Also, I'd like to know, you know, what what is the exchange rate uh, uh, that will be for the calculation? It will be on the date of the agreement, uh, a deal agreement, or when whenever you receive the check. Anna, you want to take the question? Yeah, yeah. It's the rate applicable effectively on closing, one or two days before closing. Okay, that's on the closing date, right? Yeah, essentially on the closing date. All right. Also, you know, have you put any thoughts uh, on returning cash to the shareholders once the deal concludes because we're just a month away? Yeah, so this is uh, actively being deliberated uh, with the board. Uh, I have mentioned that very clearly in my statements as well, both to the media and in previous conference calls, that yes, a big consideration is to return value to the shareholders. That is the whole purpose why the deal was done. Uh, we wanted to do it in a tax efficient manner. Uh, so all of these things are being deliberated with the board as you speak. Okay, but but uh, is there any plan for delisting, etc., uh, or you're not going on that uh, that road? No, delisting has not been considered right now. Okay, okay. But also, you know, in the presentation, you've given the uh, breakup of the uh, non-healthcare versus the healthcare. And you know there are some of these uh, verticals like technology, consumer retail, which have actually degrown. Um, technology degrew by 21%, consumer retail by 12. However, there's a growth in the other verticals. Uh, so, so can you can you shed some light on you know where exactly the portfolio of uh, non-healthcare stands in terms of growth now? So I, I don't know if you heard the conference call from the beginning. I shared with you that the growth on the non-healthcare part of the business for this quarter is double, more than double the growth for the healthcare business. Okay, overall. Yeah, yeah. On an overall basis, yeah. um, I, let me just tell you, repeat the numbers for you. Hold on. Please bear with me. Yeah, so the healthcare business for this half year compared to last year, 14.5%. Whereas the non-healthcare business, it grew by 35.3%. This is in dollar terms. So as I said, uh, the non-healthcare business has actually grown more than double that of the healthcare business. All right, all right, that's all. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. The next question is from the line of Nikhil Jain from Galaxy International. Please go ahead. <coughs> yeah, uh, good evening, sir. Thanks for the opportunity. Just a couple of uh, points. So, one Nikhil, was. Sorry, uh, you. Your voice is sorry, coming it's very clear. Very muffled. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. So, I hope this is better. Yes. Yeah, uh, so, sir, what I was uh, just trying to understand was uh, two points. So one was. Uh, Let's say uh, we were uh, um, looking at some um, acquisitions or some other uh, uh, ways to use the cash once uh, once it is available. So, has there been any progress on that aspect? And is uh, and and uh, uh, would anything be finalized closer to it? Let's say receiving receiving the money or closing out the transaction. So that is point one. So those are two independent things, returning money to shareholders in an independent track and funding growth both organically and inorganically is another track, right? So there is enough cash available to do justice to both. So mergers and acquisitions is something that we've done on an ongoing basis throughout our history. And as we speak, we evaluate multiple targets every quarter. So that's where we stand today. Right, so but uh, what I actually wanted to understand was that are we looking at some kind of a big acquisition given the money involved, or is it like kind of a smaller acquisition that we have been doing in the past and building up on, on those bases? So, is there any thought, any progress, or any any guidance on that? 
So mostly our acquisitions that we are talking about are in the technology space. Uh, we made it very clear that uh, by 2025 we'll become a technology company. Right, so our efforts are therefore to grow our digital and our technology factories. So most of our acquisitions are therefore, uh, the acquisition targets therefore are today focused on uh, digital and technology acquisitions. Right, and uh, the size of the quantum, uh, we cannot still, let's say, we have not. Uh, no, had any I thoughts on see, no, I, I don't think I, I don't think I can tell you anything in specific because there isn't anything specific that we have right now. We evaluate this on an ongoing basis. So, okay, fair enough. Uh, and just uh, my second question was that, uh, let's say, with the money that is received, so and uh, uh, from our current calculation, so is there any intent of the management uh, to? let's say, further uh, uh, increase the exposure to the group company through ICDs or loans, or is it like a cap of, of uh, let's say, around 500 or crores? So the current cap is 500 crores, and we are well within that. And we don't expect to increase it post the closure of the deals, so, right? so we have more cash available. So I did not make any comment on what's going to happen once the deal closes. Right now, it's five minutes close, and we're going to remain within that gap. Okay, fine. Thank you. I will come back and get you. Thank you. Participants, you may press star and one to ask a question. The next question is from the line of Manish Chain from Value Force Digital Media. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, good evening. My question is that uh, from this uh, deal value of 1.2 billion dollars is there any money which is going specifically to the promoters and not coming to the company as a no complete deal or in any other form money which will not come to company but will go to promoters no all money will come to the com company okay thank you sir that was my question precisely Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Kapil Varma from SGS India. Please go ahead. Kapil Varma, may I request you to unmute your line from your sir and go ahead with your question, please. Hi. Uh, my question is that uh, after signing of the BTA, what is the closing date? Is it 90 days or it's uh, 60 days? I think we have covered that multiple times uh, on this Q&A today. At least I have answered these questions at this stage three times. Okay. Uh, second question is that uh, uh, you, uh, we are so thinking for acquisition of organic and inorganic things. So what is the percentage we are looking for the entire deal size for the acquisitions? Again, I answered this question. I can't talk about a specific deal value. We are looking at acquisitions in the technology space. So right now, there isn't any specific target that we have in mind that says that this is the amount that we're going to spend. But, but uh, the no funds that are like available to the company, hmm. the funds that are available to the company post the return of money to the shareholders are going to be used for organic and inorganic and debt reduction. And uh, uh, like uh, earlier acquisitions, uh, we used to bleed money or, and losses uh, year by year. So are there any plans that uh, we are not uh, requiring any loss-making entities? So I think that is a very good question. I think we have... We have had uh, many criticisms about the two uh, healthcare businesses that we acquired, we are, which are loss-making. And you can find from the fact that we are able to sell that business as 1.2 billion, that that criticism was actually unfounded. Some of these acquisitions bring in capabilities that are uh, not immediately cash, uh, you know, accretals or earnings accretals. You need to invest in those businesses to turn these things around, and then they start gaining value. The fact that these businesses, along with some of the acquisitions that we have done, which were loss making, are actually being sold at this fantastic $1.2 billion valuation tells you that just because there is some amount of cash burned to turn 
some of these acquisitions around to build on these capabilities. Uh, but it steps in the right direction. And this would Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Participants, you may press star and one to ask the question. The next question is from the line of Jay Patel from ABK Consultants. Please go ahead. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, so just wanted to mm -hmm. check about your rationale uh, for exiting the healthcare business. Was it because you found a good opportunity, a better opportunity? Or was was it because the healthcare business has had reached its uh, saturation? I think that's an interesting question. We found that the business was not able to attract the value uh, that it deserves uh, from the Indian stock markets. Uh, it is a U.S. Uh, centered business. All its revenues as Pala shared is in the U.S. And therefore, people's ability to understand what this business is and what its net, uh, what its inherent worth is, they're always finding the gap in understanding. And it is obviously uh, my inability to sell the story well to the Indian stock market. You saw the unlocking of the value that happened uh, when uh, an investor came in and understood what this business is all about. So we couldn't have continued with the valuation that we got with the business in the India stock exchanges as opposed to its inherent worth to a possible investor. That, we found that that was not the best way to continue to keep the business in our portfolio. Uh, understood, sir. And uh, next question, sir, on the same lines. Uh, now with wealth, healthcare vertical gone, uh, which vertical will actually replace when you see in terms of contribution to the revenue, overall revenue? We have quite a few, quite a few good verticals. We have got technology media telecom that is doing well. We have done, you've got the public sector which is doing well, and we've got the digital businesses. So these three verticals will continue to be our engine for growth. Uh, understood, sir. Thank you, sir, for responses. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome. Next question is from the line of Manish Parikh, individual investor. Please go ahead. Hello. Uh, congratulations, sir, for the good set of numbers. Sir, I had this uh, small question on the uh, financial, on the balance sheet side. Uh, the loans uh, section, uh, there is a uh, advances of 552 crores as on uh, September 21. And if we look at the related party, it is around 389 crores. Can you help me understand the uh, residual amount to, uh, uh, to which party the amount is given? Follow, you'll take that question. Yeah, so it's an entity which is not the related party, so that's why it is uh, uh, showing up. Uh, that's why the difference uh, you're talking about. Okay, because uh, I was re uh, referring to the credit rating report uh, uh, by Crisil, they have mentioned that uh, uh, to the group and the group entities overall, the advances are to the tune of 553 crores. So uh, I think there is a small discrepancy uh, there in the rating report. Maybe they have missed out or... Uh, uh... Yeah, so, okay, uh, thank you for pointing this out. I'll go and check that out. But clearly, if you look at our FI uh, 21 audited balance sheet, uh, okay. there is, the numbers are clear, what is the loan, which is also what we have published for 31st March 21. Uh, the uh, the loans which are there to related parties. Very true, sir. Very true. So I was a bit confused because in the credit rating report they mentioned that uh, as on June 30th, 553 crores are given to the uh, 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 exposure to the group entities. So uh, no, no, yeah. No. yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, we will take this up. I uh, we, uh, thank you for pointing this up. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank. You. Bye. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Nikhil Jain from Galaxy International. Please go ahead. Thank you once again for the opportunity. Uh, thank you once again for the opportunity. Just an additional question to Bala sir. Sir, this uh, uh, from the transaction convenient, so out of this $1.2 trillion, how much is you? Your voice is coming. I just try, try to do better. Uh, I hope it is better now. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. 
Yeah, so what I was just uh, asking was that uh, out of the total transaction value of $1.2 billion, what would be the net amount that will come to the organization, let's say post the payment of taxes and other capital gains or other uh, other statutory levies? So any any idea or any 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 working on that um, which you have, which you can share? So, uh, yeah, yeah, so I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the AGM notice what was published uh, earlier. Uh, essentially, the uh, uh, it the transaction has a business um, transfer component or a slump sale, as you'd call it in India, for India, Philippines, and Jamaica. Whereas the transaction in US or US entity pertains to the sale of the uh, sale of shares, right? Uh, so the the tax rate for India and Philippines uh, is roughly about 22%, given that the Philippines is a branch of the Indian entity. Um, the, since the U.S. portion uh, is through sale of shares of the U.S. entities by a Mauritius, our Mauritius subsidiary, uh, there the tax rates will be uh, pretty much uh, close to uh, zero negligible. So at the overall level, uh, you know, we're working through, but we expect somewhere in the range of uh, 10 to 12 percent going towards taxes. Right. So that means that basically, out of 1.2 billion dollars, so the net uh, inflow into the organization would be around 1.05 billion dollars, plus minus a couple of yeah, yeah, yeah. Somewhere, somewhere, somewhere. Right. And uh, my second uh, question was with respect to the comment uh, that. Uh, Arthas have made actually about the value being recognized by the stock exchanges. So today also if I look and I have been a shareholder for some time, so the market cap of the company actually is less than half of the even the cash that is coming into the organization actually. Right? And leave aside the business uh, that we will have which will run very well over the next couple of years. So any thoughts, any anything, uh, what what is the reason for this uh, is still stock market not giving us the value that we deserve. Yeah, so that is a matter of speculation, sir. I, I cannot comment. I simply may answer the question that why did we sell the business? The discrepancy between the price at which this business was being quoted in, in the Indian stock exchanges and the value that we were able to get from an investor who understands the US healthcare it was so large but you know, just for the benefit of the shareholders, it did not make sense for us to continue to retain the business. That's why we did that. So that is, uh, so hopefully people have seen that. Hopefully this will give people a better understanding, the investors in this company and the Indian investor, a better understanding of what we do. The fact that so much value could be unlocked in that particular transaction. And hopefully, therefore, you will see the performance and the results and value the company differently. This is all I can say. The rest of it is a matter of speculation. Okay, fair enough. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Thank you. Participants, you may press star and one to ask the question. The next question is from the end of Raghav Agarwal from Star Securities. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you for the opportunity. Um, so, Mr. Partha, in the last call, you had hinted at you know your tuck-ins being around twenty-five million dollars. So, and now that we're learning that you know, please. Uh, sorry, 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 sorry. What did you say? Uh, I didn't hear you properly. Can you please repeat what you said? Yeah, sure. So, in the last con call, uh, you hinted at you know your future tuck-ins to be around twenty-five million dollars. Um, so, based on that evidence, and can you hear me? Am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so based on that, you know, uh, is it fair uh, to estimate that even if we are aggressive in our acquisitions, uh, that, you know, you can still um, reward the shareholders with about $6,700 million out of the cash that's coming in? Look, we will reward the shareholders pretty handsomely. I don't want to make a comment on the amount of that will be returned. Okay, the whole purpose of doing this exercise was to unlock value for the shareholders. And okay. we are not going away from that from that requirement, from that objective. 
So I will not be able to give you specifics about quantum and all of that because this is currently being considered under deliberation with the board. We are looking at making it tax efficient as well. Not all forms of returning money to shareholders is equally tax efficient. There are mm -hmm. multiple ways of doing that. Some are more tax efficient, some are not. So, you know, this is still under deliberation. I won't be able to tell you specifically what amount is coming back at this level. This is very premature. All right. Thank you for that. And one more thing, I mean, like, you know, on the remainder portion of our business, uh, what would you, what according to you is, you know, uh, a value? I mean, what should be our actual value if we don't consider what, how the Indian market is actually valuing our business? Well, the, uh, if you look at the healthcare business, it's $400 million. It's been valued at $1.2 billion. That is at three times revenues, right? Yeah, correct. So that gives you an indication. Rest of it, as a CEO, I will always feel that I'll undervalue. So, you know, it's always a matter of uh, <laughs> perception. Yeah. It's up to you to take a call. Right? I can only show you profits. I can only show you cash flows. I can only show you strength of the balance sheets. And I can show you a track record of past 20 years of providing quarter on quarter growth and profitability and dividends. Right? Mm -hmm. so you yeah, that's something you've done phenomenally well. It's not me yeah. to comment on. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Manish, Manish Yen from Value First. Please go ahead. Yeah. Thanks for giving me a uh, chance to ask a second question. Uh, there was just now a question that uh, the value in the stock market is not even close to what the deal value will be. Right? So market capitalization is lower. So there I want to make a comment. I am mean, part of various discussions and forums in which stock, uh, I mean, shareholders of Hinduja Global give their comments and write things. I think one of the reasons for lower stock market price is that people have this fear in their mind that a good part of the money which will come in the company will go to promoter group entities. So if management makes a very clear uh, commitment that more money will not go to group companies, I can assure you that share price will go up immediately by uh, at least 25 to 30%. So this fear has to be removed from the mind of the shareholders if you really want to achieve your objective of giving good value to the shareholders. So this is my comment. If you can give some commitment, some answer, that would be great. No, I thought we already answered that question. I clearly said no, that none of this money that is going to come in is going to go to the promoters. All the money is going to come to the company. I thought we already answered that question earlier in the call. No, I'm saying as, as ICDs, as intercorporate loans. Money will not go to promoters, but no, not more loans will be given to uh, group companies or promoter group companies. I'm there is a cap of 500 million. Will... We are within that 500 million. We are we are within that cap, so we have not exceeded those caps. No, so that will definitely show in the stock prices now post this conference call. Yeah, I can't comment on that. I've already committed what uh, the sale proceeds are going to go into. So that we have said, nothing is going to the promoters. The entire money is coming in the company. No, I think you're over time, right? Company, but the com money which is coming to the company now will not be given as fresh loans to the com uh, to the group companies. So that commitment will be very useful. Okay, I think uh, you should look at how we return money to the shareholders, and then let's have a chat again. Okay, thank you. I don't believe that shareholders will have any reason to complain, given. Uh, the fact that the only reason that we did this deal was to unlock value for shareholders. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we will take that. We have run out of time now. Ladies and gentlemen, we will take that as the last question. I will now hand the conference over to Mr. Srinivas for closing comments. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your time and joining us 
uh, on this uh, Q2 earnings session and also for a lot of feedback and the questions which were asked. Um, thank you for joining us on this call and look forward to interacting with you when we do our Q3 earnings. Have a good day. Thank you very much. On behalf of Hinduja Global Solutions Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us. You may now disconnect your lines. Thank you.